I th thank you. Good morning, everyone. So this is a joint work with Dimitri, who's going to follow up with all the technical uh, stuff, and with uh, Sergio Reisbaum, who's supposed to show up today uh, sometime. Now, in this talk, I'm going to focus on two things. One is the application area, because uh, for many of you, uh, concurrent computation may be an unfamiliar area, and I want you to at least have a good intuitive understanding of what the problems are. And the other is the intuition of how you transform <coughs> dynamic processes that unfold in time into static combinatorial structures. Uh, Dimitri will follow up with a lot of technical things, but I really want to uh, focus on the intuition here. And if I start running out of time, I'm going to skip over the Greek letters and, and focus more on the uh, pictures, just so, so you know in advance. Now, uh, traditionally, people think of computers as Turing machines. You know, this is the great accomplishment of uh, classical computer science is to say that computation is the same as Turing machines. And of course, this is still, uh, still true, but <coughs> when you focus on concurrent and distributed uh, computation, uh, this becomes uh, less uh, central to what we're doing. So we're not contradicting any of these classical results, but we're saying instead that there is a different way to think about these things uh, that addresses problems that are uh, difficult and obscure to address by a classical uh, means. So as far as we're concerned, the difficulty in concurrent computation is not computability as such, you know, the various hierarchy of languages and, and things like that, the difficulty is how you do coordination and communication. How do you guarantee that everyone has enough information to make local decisions that are all uh, globally uh, compatible with, uh, with one another? Now, <coughs> the um, position that I'm going to take used to be fairly controversial. I think it's uh, less controversial now. But it concerns uh, the philosophical uh, question of how do you talk about uh, concurrent computations. Now, concurrent computations are often represented as interleavings. That's the natural way to think about it. I have several processes running along at different speeds, and they interleave in different ways. And the number of interleavings is huge. You know, it's uh, exponential. And uh, how do you know that there isn't some interleaving that isn't going to do something wrong? And uh, this is, in fact, why computers are so insecure, is because people are not very good at that. So <clears throat> the natural way to think about this is to say, well, distributed computations are processes that unfold in time. A computation is a movie. This happens, then that happens, then something else happens. Uh, what uh, we're going to propose is an alternative view which says that we're going to view uh, concurrent computations as uh, static combinatorial objects. Uh, that we're going to give you a single structure, actually a simplicial complex, that in and of itself captures all the possible interleavings in a static form. So there's no notion of time, no notion of unfolding, everything is sitting out there frozen. And it turns out that the topological structures of these, uh, of these um, static uh, computational models determine what is and is not uh, computable in, uh, in these uh, contexts. So <coughs> uh, I'm going to try to contrast the operational approach, which has the advantage that it's kind of intuitively clear what you're talking about, with the combinatorial approach, which is the, uh, uh, to us the interesting uh, contribution of this work. Now, uh, one thing about... Uh, distributed computing is there are many different models. And everybody has their own favorite model, and unfortunately many of your results depend on, on the assumptions of your model. So one of the most basic is uh, what is your model of communication? Uh, do the processes send messages to each other? Do they share memory? Do they share black boxes that can do uh, complex atomic computations? And each of these models are legitimate. A, a GPU, uh, for example, is a shared memory of a certain kind a uh, network is message passing. Uh, and so fixing the uh, model of, of communication is an important step. Uh, model of failures is, is important. Uh, do processes crash? A computational model without failures isn't very interesting because uh, you're kind of assuming away um, uh, something that actually happens. So there are basically two models. There's a crash model, which is the one we're going to focus on, and then there's a more challenging Byzantine model. And for those of you who are sticking around for the conference, I'll talk about uh, uh, topological approaches to Byzantine models uh, then. But here I'm going to focus on crash uh, models. And then uh, timing. Do processes share clocks? Do they share clocks reliably, unreliably, uh, and, and so on? Uh, that also has a huge effect on uh, what you can and can't uh, compute. 
So if everybody shares an exact uh, clock, then many computations are easier, but that's kind of an unrealistic uh, assumption in the real world. So <coughs> let me give you a... Um, I'm going to start out with very informal uh, examples and then tighten up as we go along. So the key idea is that each process has a local state or a local uh, view. So just for purposes of example, suppose that each process has a three-bit local uh, state. And never mind the interpretation of the state, this is just uh, you know, something it has in its uh, memory. And <coughs> we have a global invariant that if we have two processes, these uh, little chip figures represent uh, processes or threads. You, know, you can think of them as physical processors if you want. Uh, and the rule is that uh, they're allowed to differ by one bit. Uh, nobody knows which bit, but uh, globally, uh, if we have two processes, uh, their uh, views differ by one bit. And we can represent that. We can get rid of the uh, little cartoon uh, figure and just say, well, I'm going to represent the state of a process as a vertex, which you can think of either as a point in higher dimensional Euclidean space or just an abstract thing. And so we're going to label the vertex. And if the two states are compatible, meaning that they could happen simultaneously, we'll draw an edge between them. So uh, we're using the language of simplicial complexes to talk about uh, local process states, which are the vertexes, and the non-local states, which are going to be uh, edges and then uh, uh, later simplexes. So here, if we talk about a two-process state, then we don't need simplexes, we can get by with graphs. And so all possible system configurations, for example, where let's say that the blue process has uh, one, one, one. So we'll fix that as initial condition. And then we can represent all the other possible uh, states by this uh, uh, cube, cubicle graph. And uh, where the color indicates the identity of the process, there's a blue process and a red process. And the uh, label is its internal uh, state. And one way to think of this is that um, if, you, if you pick a vertex here, its, na its neighbors represent all the possible states that are compatible with uh, that uh, vertex. And in a uh, s sense that can be made precise, this captures what that process knows. So blue, if it knows it's in state 1, 1, 1, it knows that red has to be one of those three states. So let's as a little bit of trivial computation and say each process can send a message to its neighbor saying, here's my uh, local state. Uh, but in order to make things interesting, we'll say that in that message exchange, at most one of those might be lost. Maybe zero are lost, maybe one are lost. Uh, they can't both be lost. So <clears throat> after one exchange of messages, after one communication round, uh, the states that a pair of messages can, ha a, a state that a pair of processes can have looks kind of like this. So here <coughs> we have each process keeps track of what it knows about the others. So red says, I know I have 110, uh, but I didn't get a message. I mean, the question mark. So that says uh, one message was lost. But if red's message was lost, then green got his message, and green says, I know that I have 111, and I know that uh, red has uh, 110 and so on. So th these are the only possibilities. So in some sense, what we've done is we've taken the single edge and we've subdivided it by, ex by passing a uh, semi-reliable message between the pair. And if we look at this globally, this was the edge we were looking at before, uh, the set of possible system states uh, looks like this now, after one round of uh, computation. Now, the interesting thing here is that uh, there are a lot more vertices and edges, but the overall topology, which I'm deliberately not going to uh, formally define yet, is, is the same. It's still a cube. All we've done is we've taken this uh, cubical graph and we've subdivided it. And this idea that uh, these rounds of computation change or do, do not change the overall topology of the graph or eventually simplicial complex is the key idea behind uh, uh, this particular uh, study. So we've gone from uh, this global state over here to that global state over there in one round of a uh, computation. And <clears throat> it's not too hard to see that if we ran for more rounds of computation, 
we would further and further subdivide things, but the overall shape of the graph would be unchanged. So now let's um, change our model and say, suppose communication is reliable. Suppose you're guaranteed that the message uh, will be uh, delivered. So then, uh, instead of having uh, this uh, graph as the end of a one round computation, we end up with this graph. And uh, you know, that might not look terribly interesting, but if we go back to the original uh, picture, uh, now you can see that we've uh, taken our uh, original uh, cube, and instead of simply subdividing and leaving the topology unchanged, we've changed its uh, connectivity. So there's a sense in which computational power is correlated with changes in uh, connectivity. So a model of computation where messages are reliably delivered is more powerful than one where they're not. Because if they're not delivered, then there's always some uncertainty about who knows what. But <clears throat> in this case, we can, uh, in some sense, rip the cube apart into uh, pieces, which is uh, a more powerful um, uh, picture. If anybody wants to ask questions, feel free to, to interrupt. Okay, I'm going to give you another uh, informal picture before I uh, start um, talking about the, the machinery. And that is this, uh, there's this famous uh, uh, children's uh, puzzle uh, called the, the Muddy Children. It comes in a number of uh, different uh, forms. Uh, but the idea here is that uh, we have, uh, we're, we're in a, a, a kindergarten, and there are three children. <coughs> They're actually robot children, but never mind. And there's a big muddy puddle. And there's a clock. And some of the children get, get dirty. Uh, the way they get dirty is they get uh, dirt on their foreheads, so no child can see whether it itself is dirty, but the child can tell whether the other children are dirty. And the teacher comes along and looks at them and says, ah, I can see that at least one of you is dirty. And so, here are the rules, you're not allowed to speak to each other. And if you realize that you yourself are dirty, you must raise your hand and confess on the hour. So this is a kind of a classical uh, problem. And uh, so what happens is, here's one scenario where uh, we have uh, one, or is it two? Oh, it's two dirty children at one o'clock. At one o'clock, the first hour, there's silence. Neither, one said, neither of the two dirty children says anything. On the second hour, they both confess. And uh, this, of course, happens because the children are perfectly rational and so on. And if you uh, read this in your mathematical recreation uh, magazine, the, the explanation they'll give you is the following. This is the logic. So here's a scenario where there's only one dirty child in the middle. So the dirty child, <clears throat> when the hour comes, says, everyone else is clean, but the teacher told us that there was a dirty child. It has to be me. So on the hour, it uh, confesses. <clears throat> so we roll back. And each child looks around and says, I see another dirty child. Uh, the hour comes along, and nobody confesses. And he says, well, if he were the only dirty child, he would have confessed. Therefore, he must have seen some other dirty child, which would only be me. And therefore, I know I'm dirty, and I know that we are the only two dirty children. And so we confess. He confesses. And the way to think about this is that... Uh, each child has a mental picture of the possible uh, system states. Now, what I just gave you was an operational um, uh, solution. You think this, you think that. If this happens, then that must have happened. And uh, some kind of time and sequential, uh, be sequential behavior is uh, key to what's going on. And this is the usual way that people explain this. So um, <clears throat> let's go over this in a more kind of combinatorial way. So here the idea is each process has its own input, which is what it can see. And again, it can't see itself. Uh, we can replace pictures with symbols. And uh, as we did before, we'll uh, say, e well, each process state is a vertex. Each child state is a vertex. Uh, the color is the child identity, and the label is what it sees. So here, for example, the um, bluish-green child uh, doesn't know its, its own uh, status, but it sees that the other two have value 1. Which, and so that 
triangle is a global state because it, it's the collection of everybody's local states. And if we put them all together, we get something that looks like this, where each vertex is labeled. Uh, so each triangle is a possible configuration of the, state, of the world. At the, at the very top, everything is zero and all the children are clean. Each vertex is labeled with a local view. And notice that the places where the, vertice, where the triangles intersect represents ambiguity. So if two triangles intersect at a vertex that says that there are two global states compatible with this local state. So that, uh, that vertex represents a state where that process, that child knows that these are the only possible states, but, there, but there's typically more than one. So at the very top, they're all dirty. At the very bottom, sorry, at the very top, they're all clean. At the bottom, they're all dirty. And all the intermediate states are represented uh, here. Now, <coughs> when the um, teacher says, one of you is dirty, then uh, that eliminates the very top uh, simplex because it says this uh, simplex where everyone is clean is not actually possible anymore. Then uh, when an hour goes by without uh, anyone confessing, it says we know that uh, another layer of uh, triangles uh, must, uh, be, uh, must go away because if we were in any of those, the uh, child would have confessed and so on uh, down the line. So at some point, so each uh, round, each hour on the hour, uh, we remove another layer. And if we get all the way to the end uh, without uh, anyone confessing, then it must be that they're all dirty. So again, we're using, <coughs> the, you know, there's nothing profound about this. This is just an example of how we use the language of labeled uh, simplicial complexes to uh, talk about uh, distributed system states. So um, we need something to compute. So classical computability theory talks about functions. And so what's the analog of functions in a parallel and distributed world? Uh, well, the simplest interesting kind of computation is something called a, a task. So in a, a task, we we'll say each process starts out with a private input value. Uh, this input value could be something uh, that you get across a network. It could be something you see out the window. It could be an idea you just had. But it's private. Only you know that. Uh, then they communicate with each other. And how do the processes communicate? Well, it could be by message passing. It could be by shared memory. It could be by all smoke signals for all we care. Uh, but some information is, uh, is transferred uh, back and forth. And then <coughs> after a finite number of steps, each process stops and says, this is my output value. You know, open the door on the um, uh, bank machine and uh, hand out money. Uh, tr you know, um, apply the brakes to your self-driving car, you know, some kind of decision. And we want these, uh, each, these have to be computed in a finite number of steps, and they have to be able to tolerate whatever kind of failures our model can uh, produce. So we're, we're not talking about long live computation, we're talking about short finite uh, computations. Uh, <clears throat> here is a kind of a classical example of a task. This is not the only task we're interested in, but it's uh, in some sense the most important. It's called the consensus. And here the idea is each process starts with a private input, which I've represented as an integer. Uh, they communicate with each other, uh, something either pairwise, broadcast, uh, whatever your, your model is. And then af after a finite number of steps, they all agree on somebody's uh, 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 input. So we want them to agree because that uh, turns out to be hard. We want them to choose some, somebody's input because uh, if all we cared about was agreement, we could have them just halt with zero immediately, and that wouldn't be very interesting. So you have to halt with somebody's input, but you don't know what that input is in advance. And it turns out that if you can solve consensus, you can solve any other uh, 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 task that you want. So consensus is universal. Now, um, I'm going to look at a particular, this is a technicality, but, uh, but I need to, to say it. We're going to look at a particular class of uh, tasks, uh, which I'll call colorless tasks, where the definition of what a correct output is doesn't depend on the identities of the processes or how many times a value appears. Uh, this is, um, there, there's analogous theorems for more general uh, tasks, but I'm not going to have time to uh, go into that, so I'm restricting colorless tasks just because it's a somewhat uh, simpler uh, problem. Uh, but you don't need to worry about that because it's not uh, uh, all that important. So the set of input values determines the set of output values. And so consensus has this uh, property because the set of output values is this, 
it's just that the, every output has to be somebody's input. And we don't care whose input it was, or if the same input showed up twice, it doesn't matter. So this is a, uh, an example of a colorless uh, task. So the, n the number of identical inputs and the identities of who holds them don't matter. So we don't, ne don't need to worry too much about uh, process identities. Okay, so um, now I'm going to go and give you some uh, actual definitions. So I'm going to do the operational model, uh, which is again kind of intuitively appealing. You can look at this and say, uh, yes, that's how a, a multiprocessor uh, should work. Uh, but we'll see that it it's can be kind of awkward to prove interesting results. I'm going to go over the combinatorial model then, and my hope is that you look at it and say, oh, now I see how I can sort of remove time from the description and recast everything as virtual complexes. And if you understand that, then my work is done in some sense. And, uh, <coughs> but just to show that it's useful, uh, I'll, we'll do a, a main theorem at the end. So in our model, a process, uh, which you can think of, for example, as an operating system thread or a uh, you know, process or a GPU, you know, a single, it's a single sequential thread of control, uh, we'll say it's a state machine. Doesn't have to be finite as state machine. Uh, but it just ha it has a, st a state, and in response to um, uh, communication, it changes a state. Uh, we're not particularly interested in the computational power. You know, it could be a Turing machine. It could be something uh, more powerful than Turing machine, uh, something with an oracle. It turns out it doesn't really matter because the impossibility results that we care about are all kind of information theoretic uh, results. And it says that no matter what kind of local computation you can do, you just don't have enough information to make a decision. So we don't care whether you're a Turing machine or uh, you know, some kind of oracle. It's not going to do you any good because uh, your knowledge is too ambiguous uh, to, uh, to uh, decide. <coughs> so we'll call the uh, process state its view. Because typically uh, the, we use this as saying this encapsulates what this process knows locally about the global state of the world. <coughs> Uh, processes have uh, names. Uh, each, each process has a unique name, which I'm going to represent as a color in uh, the examples. So if you see different colors, that means it's different uh, processes. Uh, each process knows its own name. And uh, typically, it doesn't know the names of the other processes. Uh, sometimes this is important, sometimes it's not important. And so we'll, we'll uh, pick whatever assumption is uh, most uh, convenient uh, for at, the, at, the, uh, at the time. Uh, the process name is often its index. So if you're process 37, then your name is 37 in a lot of examples. Uh, sometimes uh, that's cheating and we want to solve uh, uh, puzzles where, uh, you don't, where, where you can't make that uh, assumption. Uh, we're not going to be able to do any of those uh, here, but I just wanted to mention that. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, they're uh, different. So you might know your unique name, but you might not know what, what your index is. So a, uh, a system, a distributed system, we have a bunch of processes, each one of which is an individually a, a sequential a state machine. Uh, there are n plus one of them. Uh, there's n plus one instead of n because we're going to want to talk about dimensions. And uh, so an n-dimensional uh, uh, simplex uh, will carry the state of n plus one processes. Uh, I'm going to uh, mostly talk about a read, shared read-write memory, where uh, processes can read and write a shared memory. Uh, almost everything I'm going to say uh, carries over to message passing uh, models with minor uh, technical uh, changes. Uh, now. Simply reading and writing an individual word of memory is a little bit cumbersome. So mathematically, it's a very powerful model, but when you try to write programs using it and you try to prove things, then there's a lot of tedium. So what we like to do is we like to say, well, we're going to recast read-write in this slightly artificial form, which is much easier to reason about. And mathematically, they're the same. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the only fault is, is a crash, yes. So, so if you write to memory, you might crash halfway through and nothing will be written. Or you might complete the write and then crash. But uh, everything in memory is uh, consistent. 
But that's an important question because things can change radically if you allow uh, in that kind of failure. So um, what we could say is instead of reading and writing an individual uh, word, let's say that you can take an atomic snapshot of the entire memory and copy, make a local copy. Now that sounds fairly radical and unrealistic, but it turns out that there are well-understood algorithms that allow you to transform individual word read and writes into a global snapshots. You know, they're order n cubed uh, algorithms, so nobody does them in practice. But from an analytical point of view, particularly for impossibility results, this makes our life a lot easier. In fact, <coughs> we're going to go even one step further and use something called an immediate snapshot, which is a special form of a snapshot. So an immediate snapshot, uh, each process uh, writes its entire state to memory. Uh, then it takes a snapshot of the world, of the entire memory. So uh, if uh, Dimitri and I are, are, are running together, each of us writes our state to memory and each of us takes a snapshot. And now I have a vector of uh, two uh, previous uh, states. Uh, but the guarantee we're going to make is even though we're interested in a kind of an asynchronous system where things aren't um, we don't share clocks, I'm going to insist that uh, the writing the view and taking the snapshot happen one right after the other. This is not the same as saying atomically, they take two dis distinct steps. But the first step I take a, a, a snapshot, the second one I do a write. But the other processes, oops, the other processes can do the same. So you can have two processes that both simultaneously write to memory and simultaneously take snapshots. So this is why it's not a read, modify, write operation. And this might look a little weird, but it turns out this also can be simulated just using standard reads and writes. And uh, there's lots of uh, literature on that, so you, you trust me on this. And so <coughs> these are our concurrent steps. So this is uh, how we'll write this. We'll say immediate, uh, I'll uh, write my view to memory, I'll take a snapshot of everything in memory. Now, uh, there's some this has some interesting properties. So here is an execution, an immediate snapshot execution, where each process, each column is a process. There's P, Q, and R. Uh, each uh, row is a step in time. So the first one, P writes, then takes a snapshot. Then Q writes and takes a snapshot, and so on. And at the very bottom, this is the view. So P sees its own value. I'm using lowercase for the values. Uh, Q sees its value and P's value because it did the snapshot after Q and, and R did the same thing. Now I can take this schedule and um, shift it a little bit and I get this other schedule and if you look at everybody's uh, values at the end you'll see that two of them are the same but only one has changed. So it says I can shift the execution by a little bit and only change one uh, view. And uh, here I've shifted it one more time, and each transition, each arrow, only changes one uh, processes a view. Uh, you can say, well, this isn't realistic because my uh, uh, Intel uh, processor doesn't actually do this, but as I said, uh, we can implement this, and since we're mostly interested in, in impossibility results anyway, if it's impossible under this model, it's impossible in general. Yeah. Uh, let's assume for now that everybody has a dedicated uh, slot and, and that there's, there's no bounds on how big it is. You, know, you can get around that, but, th but this is a kind of a nice simple abstraction. Uh, we have, assume the processes crash, you can halt without warning. Uh, we'll tolerate uh, as many as n out of n plus 1. Uh, algorithms that tolerate n plus 1 out of n plus 1 aren't very interesting. Uh, we'll assume that we have an asynchronous model of computation that uh, uh, they don't share clocks, nobody knows how, uh, fa we have no bounds on their relative uh, speeds. Uh, asynchronous failures have uh, interesting property that you can never detect a failure. So uh, a process that is crashed is indistinguishable from one that's simply very slow. And this is what makes uh, things uh, interesting. Uh, formally, uh, we'll talk about a global state as a configuration, which is a set of simultaneous process states. This is just writing in Latin letters, uh, you know, the pictures that we had before. Uh, we'll s we have initial configurations and final configurations because we're interested in uh, finite computation uh, mostly. 
an execution, we have an infinite configuration, a set of processes that communicate, uh, and so on, all the way through. So again, there's nothing surprising here, I'm just introducing a notation. Uh, we'll say a concurrent step is configuration, some set of processes wake up, uh, a new configuration. Uh, we say that they participate, and uh, you can only change your state if you participate. Uh, this means uh, no kind of magical uh, action at a distance. So state uh, changes is only communication. So in execution, we have finite, uh, infinite executions. Uh, we can talk about partial executions where we say we'll, we'll look at a prefix of a longer execution. Uh, crashes are implicit, again, because they're undetectable. So if at the end uh, uh, some process is not in the final state, then it must have crashed. But this captures uh, the idea that we cannot uh, detect it crashes in a finite uh, time because we could always extend that execution by uh, reviving that process and letting it take more steps. So <coughs> represent a task as a triple. We have a, I'll show you what this uh, means uh, in a minute, but this is, we look at all the possible ways you can assign inputs to processes, all the possible ways you can assign outputs, and then we have a special kind of a map called a, a carrier map that says that if these are your inputs, then here is the range of possible outputs. And it's a range of possible outputs because uh, concurrent uh, computations are, are necessarily non-deterministic. And I'll, I'll show you concrete examples of this uh, in, a, uh, in a minute. Uh, for example, suppose we have um, binary consensus. We want, everyone wants to agree on zero or one. So uh, inputs, uh, one possible input is everybody starts out with zero. You know, because this is colorless, I'm only going to write the uh, uh, values, not uh, who, who gets assigned what. Or everyone could start out with one, or they could start out with both. Those are the only possible initial configurations. Uh, outputs, they can all decide zero, or they can all decide one. That's, that's all, uh, all you get. Uh, this, um, <coughs> this delta says if everyone starts out with zero, then everyone must decide zero and symmetrically uh, for one. Uh, with mixed inputs, you can decide either zero or you can decide one, but everyone must agree. That's why each of these uh, sets here is a singleton set. So I'm just writing down in notation uh, what I hope your intuition already has, uh, has mastered. Uh, this is what a protocol looks like. So uh, I, you have a shared memory, which I'm going to represent as a two-dimensional memory array. So each round, we're going to write to a different row, just to keep, keep things cleaner. Each column is, belongs to a particular process. So row is a per-layer memory, where a layer is a round of execution. A column is a per-process word, and by word I mean uh, un, you know, unbounded storage that is only read by a single process. Sorry, only written by a single process. So initially, uh, all you know is your input value. Uh, then you run for n um, uh, layers, n rounds. Uh, <coughs> you do, take an immediate snapshot. We say, well, for this layer, I'm going to um, assign my view, and then I'm going to take a snapshot of that layer. So I write a piece of layer, I take a snapshot, and then I move on. So this is a full information protocol. Everybody is saying, here's my state, tell me your state. Here's my state, tell me your state. At the end, you've accumulated a lot of state, and you make a decision. Okay, then when you're done, you, this um, lowercase delta is a decision map, which says, I've seen this huge exponentially large uh, amount of a data, this means I decide zero. Or I've seen a different set of data, this means I decide one. And uh, if you actually want to work this out, if you look at all the possible um, one round immediate snapshot executions for three processes, uh, it, it looks like this. Here's your uh, uh, state. Here, P, Q, and R take um, uh, steps. These, these are the various views. The black ones are the final states. Uh, don't um, worry about this too much because we'll replace it with something much nicer. But uh, this is one of the slides where I'm emphasizing in some sense how ugly this is. Okay, so let's roll back and reapproach this from a combinatorial point of view. So at this point, you should understand what the phenomena are that we are trying to uh, describe. And now let's talk about a combinatorial description. 
So I'm going to represent a vertex as a process state. You know, we've seen this in the informal examples. So here, the green process has uh, state uh, 7. Now, the state could be its input, it could be an intermediate state, it could be a final state. And it's typically much bigger than 7. A uh, global state is a simplex. So here is a global state where uh, blue-green has uh, state 0, uh, red has state 1, green has state 2. We'll represent that as this uh, labeled uh, simplex. This means that it's OK for these three processes to have those three states simultaneously. Uh, we can talk about uh, multiple system states with this as a simplicial complex. And uh, here, there are two possible global states, which differ only in uh, green. And the fact they share an edge means that uh, uh, blue and red can't tell the difference. So uh, the fact that, that they share an edge means that there are two processes for which it's ambiguous which of these two global states holds. So this notion of kind of local ambiguity is captured by uh, how the uh, uh, simplexes are glued together. So let's look at our favorite binary consensus uh, problem. So this is what the input complex looks like. This is all the ways you can assign 0 and 1 to 3 processes independently. So if you, uh, uh, as a homework problem, prove that if you have n plus 1 processes and you assign 0, 1 to them independently, that the result is an n-sphere. So all possible states, uh, red, green, and blue, independently assign 0 and 1. <coughs> Output complex is uh, simple. It says uh, they... Uh, Output values are either all 0 or all 1, because it's consensus. And it consists of two disconnected the simplexes. So the carrier map says if you start out with these values, here are the possible outputs. So if you have all zeros, uh, then uh, obviously we have to decide all 0. If we have all 1s, the occluded um, uh, face over here, then we have to decide all 1s. If we have a mixed 0, 1 inputs, uh, then it's OK to end up on either one of these. Uh, so our task specification, going over again, is uh, input complex, output complex, and uh, the carrier map. So, and these are all combinatorial objects. It doesn't say anything about executions, doesn't say anything about time, and doesn't say anything about uh, what kind of communication you uh, use. So uh, you know, we can, um, for colorless tasks, we can simplify these a little bit, but that's a technicality, and I'm going to skip over that. Uh, now, so far, we've expressed inputs as simplicial complexes, outputs as simplicial complexes, but I haven't talked about computation. So let's represent computations as simplicial complexes as well. So that's something we'll call a protocol complex, where each vertex is labeled with a process name, and its view, its local state either the beginning, middle, or end of a computation. And the set of all possible compatible uh, local states for a computation also defines a simplicial complex, which we'll call a protocol complex. So simplex is a compatible set of views. You can think of it as a system uh, snapshot. And each execution, for example, at the end of the execution, that defines a simplex. And <clears throat> I'm going to give you a, um, for ease of presentation, I'm going to switch from the uh, asynchronous model to a synchronous model because it has nicer pictures. But imagine we have a bunch of processes, say, on a GPU that are running synchronously, and they, uh, they synchronously broadcast their states to everyone else. So in each round, you broadcast your state and you receive everyone else's state. Uh, but uh, it's possible that a processor crashes after broadcasting only part of, to only part of its uh, uh, cohort. So it could crash and not send any messages. It could send all its messages and then crash. Or it could send half its messages and crash. But that's our failure model. So <clears throat> what happens? Let's look at what happens. Let's suppose everybody starts out with zero, and we're running in this synchronous model. So initially, no messages are sent. Uh, your view is your input value. So the protocol complex so far is just the input simplex. And if we put them all together, the protocol complex is uh, when nothing has happened. It's just the input. Uh, after one round of computation, you end up with this uh, Pythagorean-looking uh, complex. So here, the solid triangle in the middle is the execution where no one fails. Uh, this square here is the, uh, all the possible execution where blue fails. 
So here, uh, Blue uh, sent all of his messages before it crashed, so it's indistinguishable from this execution where uh, nobody failed. Here, Blue sent no messages, and here it sent messages to one but not the others. Am I out of time? Um, we usually have a 10 minutes break between the parts, so... Ah, okay. Okay, then, uh, three more slides. So, uh, you know, these are all the executions after one round. Uh, when you put them together, uh, it looks like this. So this is what the uh, computation, this is the protocol complex after one round. After two rounds, it looks like that. Now, interesting thing here is, so this is um, uh, simply connected. Uh, this is not simply connected, but it's, connect it's path connected. And this is not path connected. So each round of computation lowers the level of connectivity by one. So this is uh, when you put everything together. And so what uh, <coughs> the model co computation says, we have input complex, which is mapped to the output complex by the problem specification. Our computation maps onto the protocol complex, and we have this decision map delta that maps each vertex here into an output vertex. So delta basically says, this is what I saw in my computation. This means decide zero or decide one. And it, this turns out to be a simplicial map. It's not too hard to show that. And once we know it's a simplicial map, then it becomes much easier to uh, do impossibility results. So, in particular, uh, we can use, you can find topological obstructions. So, uh, one thing that's going to be easy now is I'm going to show you that you can't solve consensus in one round by drawing pictures. So, this is the one round uh, consensus protocol over here. This is our output complex. Now, we know that if we execute, let's assume that we can do this. Uh, that everything over here where uh, all our inputs are zero, everyone has to decide zero because for all you know, those are the only inputs. Uh, similarly, the subcomplex of all one inputs, you have to decide one. But notice one side is connected and the other one isn't. So if I draw a path from all zero to all one, which I can do because we're path connected, uh, then the image has to go from the all zero to the all one and that's uh, not uh, connected. And normally, for my undergraduates, I have to march through why this is true, but uh, since you all understand about connectivity and, and simplicial maps, I'm going to uh, skip uh, uh, that part of it. Okay, so in particular, you can't solve consensus if your protocol complex is path connected. So... Why do you write a convection? No, no, that's a, that, that would follow... If I did this uh, uh, rigorously, that it would follow um, uh, uh, right away. But I'm appealing to your intuition here that, uh, you, know, the, you know, the all zero part has to map onto a zero, the all one part has to map onto one, but one is connected and the other one isn't. So if I can keep the protocol complex connected forever, then consensus is impossible. If I can keep it connected for R rounds, then that's a round complexity lower bound. And if I uh, have a real-time model, which I can't talk about because I don't have time, then that would give you a time complexity result. And there are papers discussing you each uh, one of these things. Okay, so this is a natural place to uh, stop and uh, refresh. Okay, I, w I was told that I went over the last example a little too uh, quickly, so we're going to uh, uh, go through this a little bit more step by step. So here we are, we, we're saying that if we look at the subcomplex of all, look at all the executions where there were all, all the inputs were zero, then uh, by the definition of consensus, you have to map, you have to decide zero. So every vertex in this protocol complex has to end up on that uh, top uh, triangle. Those are, those are the rules. Uh, symmetrically, if you have all one inputs, then you have to map over here. Now remember this, but this decision map is a simplicial map, which means it says that every edge goes to an edge. It's, in fact, it's color-preserving simplicial map, so it doesn't uh, collapse anything. So uh, let's, here we have a path that goes from all zero to all one, and we know this path exists because you can see that it's path connected, and that, that's, that, that's the important uh, observation. So it says if we, you know, the image of this path under a simplicial map is also going to be a path. So the image of this path has to start here and end up down there. But, you know, so if we look at the path, 
That vertex has to go here, that vertex has to go here. I think you can see where I'm going with this. And uh, you, know, you end up uh, sort of chasing your tail and uh, there's no way to uh, get from one to the other because they're disconnected. So this is how we can take a very elementary uh, connectivity related properties of the sublicial complexes and get uh, impossibility results. So it doesn't matter what your protocol is, doesn't matter how long, or, or it doesn't matter what your decision map is, you know, you can't make, you can't do this. Uh, this only works for one round because that you, we've seen if you go for two rounds, then it becomes disconnected. And then, in fact, consensus, it does uh, become possible. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to <coughs> next give you a, um, you know, fairly quick review of how to prove uh, kind of the, the fundamental theorem of um, colorless uh, tasks in asynchronous shared memory models, which characterizes which tasks are solvable and which ones aren't. So a little bit of machinery, which is probably familiar to most of you, but uh, the way we're going to approach this is slightly different from usual, so I'm going to uh, go through this. So here we have a, um, a simplex sigma. Uh, Geometric definition of uh, barycentric subdivision is you take the barycenters of all the faces and the scissors and sort of cut along uh, the, the lines. Uh, <coughs> a more combinatorial uh, approach is to say, well, each vertex of the barycentric subdivision is a face of the original. So this corner of vertex is that vertex itself. Uh, this vertex is the edge uh, between uh, uh, red and green. And the uh, Barry center in the, the, in the center of the triangle is the entire triangle. So we can represent a combinatorial a vertex of the barycentric subdivision as a face of the complex, and a, a simplex of the barycentric subdivision as an increasing sequence of uh, faces. And uh, this is uh, this turns out to be a, uh, useful in a computational way. So now I'm going to define another task. Uh, not consensus, and the input is going to be a single uh, simplex. Uh, the output is going to be the barycentric uh, subdivision. And uh, the rule is that processes, you can have any number you want, start, each process starts at the vertex of the original uh, triangle, or simplex. And uh, they're required to converge to the vertices of, uh, of the barycentric subdivision, which means that they have to agree on an increasing uh, sequence of, um, of faces. Now notice that we can't require them to all land on the same vertex because that it turns out is equivalent to consensus and we uh, it's not too hard to show that consensus is impossible in this uh, model. But approximate agreement is uh, possible. So the rule is everybody starts out on the corner, you have to converge to a uh, uh, simplex of a barycentric uh, subdivision. So in our notation, this is input complex I, which doesn't need to be single simplex. It could be an arbitrary uh, complex. Uh, it's barycentric uh, subdivision is the output. And the uh, map says that if you start out on the simplex, you have to end up on the barycentric subdivision of that simplex. <coughs> so arbitrary input complex, subdivided output complex. And we'll treat the subdivision itself as the carrier map that defines uh, what the correct answers are. <coughs> um, if there are n plus 1 processes, then uh, the only thing that we care about is the n skeleton. And again, this is a little bit of a technicality, but we'll need that uh, to give a complete statement of our uh, final uh, theorem. So uh, since there are only n plus 1 processes, uh, you can't end up on a simplex of dimension uh, more than n. So we can ignore higher dimensional simplexes. Okay, uh, the key idea here is that a one layer immediate snapshot protocol solves barycentric agreement uh, on the N uh, skeleton for N processes. So this barycentric agreement um, protocol that I showed you before in a computational operational way, uh, if you think about this in a combinatorial way, it's just barycentric agreement. It's just barycentric subdivision. Uh, so proof, okay, so every input simplex belongs to the N skeleton and immediate uh, snapshot returns a set of input vertices, which is the face of an input uh, simplex. And the faces uh, we'll see are ordered with respect to one another. And uh, that's definition, the very definition of uh, barycentric subdivisions. Uh, so one way to see this is uh, here we have an execution 
We have red, it takes an immediate snapshot, it sees only itself. Yellow runs last, it sees everyone. Uh, blue sees uh, uh, two of these things. But the snapshots that they, they see are ordered. Because that's the definition of uh, immediate snapshot. If you write together and take a snapshot together, you see each other. If you write first, you don't see me if I go later, and if I write later, I see you who went earlier. So, so they're all ordered with respect to each other, and that's the key. That's why we want immediate snapshot and not uh, a regular vanilla snapshot. So <coughs> everybody, you write out a vertex, you take an immediate snapshot, you get back a set of vertices. These vertices are ordered. And each one is a face of the original input. So this is, all I'm doing is I'm taking the, the definitions and kind of massaging them uh, slightly. And so if uh, we draw pictures, then uh, red wrote out its own uh, vertex and uh, gets back its own vertex, so it gets this uh, vertex here. Blue came after red, so it wrote out uh, V2, and so it comes back, it sees both of these, so we'll interpret that as the edge between them. Uh, yellow came along last, it sees everybody, so it gets the entire uh, thing. And uh, we can replace each simplex with, the barry, with its barry center. And that uh, sort of graphically gives us a uh, transition to the barry centric subdivision. And uh, what uh, we end up with is uh, everybody has a vertex that's on a single simplex of the barry centric subdivision. Uh, that was so much fun, we could do it multiple times. Although it's kind of a, a pain to draw it. And uh, I can go from the nth skeleton uh, to uh, the nth barycentric subdivision for big, you know, big n is distinct from little, little n, of course. And uh, that means I can take as many barycentric subdivisions as I want in this uh, model. And uh, you know, the picture looks uh, something like that. You start out on the corners, you converge to a... Uh, and this, by the way, shows that you can do kind of epsilon agreement in uh, Euclidean space, if uh, that's what you want. So we have iterated barycentric subdivision. Now let's go back and look at the one round execution. Remember, this is the operational model where each path through this tree is an interleaving. And uh, this is what a one round execution uh, looks like. Uh, but you can see that we have uh, each of these little boxes is a simplex. We can reinterpret that as a simplex, where each view is labeled a vertex. And if we put it together, it looks like this. So uh, this ugly picture that I showed you before, this is the operational point, point of view. This is the combinatorial point of view. You can see that this is a subdivision of a simplex. It's non-trivial to actually prove this, but, uh, but it's true. And it's a kind of a colored generalization of the barycentric subdivision, where instead of having single barycenter, we expand it uh, because we, each uh, triangle has to be colored with the three process IDs. And so, uh, you know, this is the, uh, something we call the standard uh, chromatic uh, subdivision. So, <coughs> um, again, this is the operational point of view if you want to understand a single round of immediate snapshot. That's the combinatorial point of view. And, uh, the, you know, this is, uh, uh, this is my kind of a polemic of why uh, combinatorial uh, approaches are uh, more satisfying than operational approaches. Um, we can talk about protocol composition, which I'm not going to go over because I'm running out of time, but it means exactly what you think it would, it would mean. It means I can do one protocol, the output of one protocol is the input to the next one, and we can pipeline them. So uh, the theorem, which, I'm, uh, which I, I just walked you through an example, which I hope is enough to convince you, is that if you do a single layer immediate snapshot to a protocol, then uh, that's, that's barycentric agreement. And if you do it n times, then you're doing agreement on the nth uh, barycentric uh, subdivision. Uh, there's a, um, remember, connectivity turns out to be important for a lot of the impossibility results. Uh, taking barycenters of a complex doesn't change its connectivity. If it didn't have holes in some dimension before you took the uh, subdivision, it's not going to have them after you take the subdivision. And so <coughs> that says that if you're using immediate snapshot, then in some sense you're not changing the homology of the, uh, of the complex. You're not tearing holes into it. 
Uh, so uh, I'll go through main theorem. I have how much time do I have? Negative uh, five minutes. Oh, hmm? uh, okay, okay. Oh, that's actually more time. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll start talking slower. <laughs> okay, so the uh, so so this is the kind of the fundamental theorem says. We want a complete characterization of all the uh, tasks that uh, have a solution in this asynchronous read write uh, model. Uh, interesting side uh, question is, is, is this theorem decidable? Uh, if it's decidable, then uh, we can write a Turing machine that comes back and if you give it a task, it will come back and tell you, yes, there is a protocol, no, there isn't a protocol. And this would be saving a lot of money because then I could fire my grad students and uh, automatically generate conference papers. Uh, it turns out to be un undecidable. Uh, through some interesting reduction to word problem for, uh, for groups. But uh, I'm, I'm going to put that out there as a provocation, but I'm not going to have time to talk about it. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> given a task, IO delta, it has a weight free, weight free means it tolerates n out of n plus 1 failures, uh, n plus 1 process, uh, layered immediate snapshot. Layered immediate snapshot means you do a snapshot on one copy of the memory and then go to the, a clean copy of the memory. Again, that's kind of a, te a technicality just to make things easy to uh, uh, analyze. You know, all of these read-write models are computation equivalent. Uh, this exists if and only if there's a continuous map uh, from the, you take the polyhedron of the uh, n skeleton of the input. So this is, uh, this is an input complex. Uh, we care about the n skeleton because we only have n processes, and uh, everything that happens above that uh, doesn't... Uh, uh, doesn't matter. So again, the, we're being a little bit uh, over technical here. So you take the point set that it occupies and you map it to the point set of the output and uh, that has to be carried by your um, uh, problem uh, spec which means just says that uh, if you <coughs> the, the, the function has to do approximately what the problem spec uh, says it has to do. In particular, the output uh, has to be a continuous image of the um, input. So you can't, if your output has holes in it, but your input doesn't, then you can't do it. And uh, simplifying somewhat, this is the source of uh, most of the impossibility results uh, that, uh, that we have, because we're talking about different levels of connectivity. There are, basically we show that there are obstructions to extending this continuous map. So um, we can, uh, the couple lemmas, so we say that, one lemma says that if there is a weight-free layered protocol for something, uh, then we can get a continuous map. So the continuous map is just a very compact way of formulating the, our computational law conditions. Uh, you know, we could write it combinatorially in terms of simplicial maps, but it would take uh, uh, like five or six more words. And then, uh, you know, we, we prefer to do it this way. So that's one thing we'll show, and then uh, we'll uh, go the other direction. And that will give us our, uh, our proof. So <coughs> let's assume that we have uh, the continuous map, and I'm going to show you how to build the protocol. So uh, here we have a, uh, our input complex. We have a barycentric um, uh, a subdivision of it, and this is our generic output complex. So uh, we have this continuous map. You know, that's our hypothesis. Uh, what we do then is we'll take a simplicial approximation. How many, how many of you are, are familiar with the notion of simplicial approximation? Basically, a simplicial approximation says that if I have a continuous map from one complex to another, then I can uh, approximate it with a simplicial map if I'm allowed to subdivide the input with, say, barry enough barycentric subdivisions. So that means I can take this sort of discrete simplicial map and get arbitrarily close to any continuous map as long as I can chop up the input into smaller and smaller uh, barycentric pieces. So <clears throat> I take a simplicial approximation, so f, I had f, and now I have phi, which is a simplicial approximation, which goes from a you know, barycentric subdivision here and we've already seen that by using a media snapshot, we can solve barycentric agreement. So we solve barycentric, we run barycentric agreement over here, 
And of course, I've shown you one uh, subdivision, one level subdivision, but it could be arbitrary level subdivisions. And that big N, the number of times you subdivide is the computational complexity, you know, it's the round complexity. And uh, then <coughs> every process takes its output vertex and it feeds it into this map phi, which we've constructed from F. And uh, then uh, that, we sort of push it uh, through here and that gives us a vertex over there. So this is not subdivided, this is the original complex. This is uh, subdivided, but uh, we have our, our bag of tricks as a way to do a convergence on the barycentric subdivision. So then we apply phi and it turns out that if you compose everything, that's exactly a, um, a protocol for solving, your, uh, for, for solving the task. And all you need is uh, the continuous map, which we hypothesized, and this barycentric agreement the protocol. Uh, so let's go the other way. So let's say, suppose I have a protocol. Now I want to show that I can get a, a continuous map out of it. And uh, this direction is, uh, is uh, much uh, easier. So I want to show that if I have a weight-free uh, read-write protocol, actually uh, replace read-write with a media snapshot, but, you know, but they're the same, if and only if there's this uh, continuous map. And so we're, we're doing uh, this direction. We're going to say if there is the protocol, then there's the map. And <coughs> again, this is um, fairly straightforward. I bet if I gave this to you as an exercise, you could probably come back in the afternoon with the solution. So what we'll do is we'll build it up on the skeletons. So <coughs> I'm going to build a family of maps, uh, one for each uh, skeleton. Uh, from the input, this is the, pro the X here is the protocol complex on the input. So the protocol complex is that complicated uh, thing with all the executions. And then I'm going to do a final step from the protocol uh, complex. But remember, I have, I've hypothesized that I have a protocol, which means I can run my program, get this big protocol complex, then, uh, then apply my decision map and get the answer that I want. So in the base, <coughs> I'm going to define uh, G0, which is a vertex map from, the, from each input vertex to the protocol uh, complex. And uh, that's easy because I just say, well, you know, if I, if I pick any, any solo execution where this process runs by itself and never hears from anyone else, which I can do because it's an asynchronous uh, computational model, then I can just pick any vertex in there. Uh, so by induction hypothesis, imagine that I have this in uh, the D minus one skeleton. So I have this uh, continuous map that does uh, what, I, what I want. Uh, then uh, for every uh, simplex in there, uh, I can, you know, this sends the uh, D minus one uh, a skeleton. Uh, but uh, there's something I didn't prove, which is that the image of the, uh, each simplex is D minus one connected. It doesn't have any holes, uh, which by its very definition means that if I have a continuous map on its boundary, I can uh, uh, extend it to the interior. And so this is where uh, connectivity, uh, notions of connectivity become important. And this would be, you know, sometimes when people um, who are not mathematicians challenge me about why I'm using all of this mathematical machinery, I say, well, you'd have a hard time talking about deconnectivity and so on without using this, uh, you know, rich uh, vocabulary of uh, simplicial uh, uh, complexes. So you can think of it as, you know, we're building up on, on the skeletons. You know, we have a imagined tetrahedron where we have something on the boundary. And we say, well, we know this doesn't map around any holes, so we can fill in the interior. And inductively, uh, we can extend that up one dimension. And we extend each one individually, but they all agree already on the, on the boundaries. And so uh, this way we can uh, build up uh, inductively to higher and higher skeletons. You know, when I <coughs> teach this for real, I go through, you know, march through the steps, but I think it's, it should be intuitively clear that you can do this. So well, we've, we've constructed now a uh, continuous map that goes from the inputs to executions. Not uh, yet to the outputs, but to, uh, to, to the uh, uh, complex of executions. Uh, but now we have this simplicial decision map, which is a vertex map. It goes from vertex to vertex in a way that uh, carries simplexes to simplexes. Uh, <coughs> and so, you know, this is the, uh, you know, it goes you take the n skeleton, again, because there's only n processes. You look at all the executions that can happen, the complex of all possible executions starting there, 
And we know we have a decision map by hypothesis that says that given any execution, we know what the answer is, which is this uh, simplicial uh, map here. And, uh, but any simplicial map induces a continuous map on the underlying uh, polyhedron, you know, just by, by linear extrapolation. So that says that we have a, a continuous map from uh, this uh, uh, point set, this polyhedron, to this point set uh, here that also uh, respects the uh, delta, the, the big delta, the, the, the problem uh, definition. And so the composition uh, gives us uh, the, exactly what we want. So what I've shown is that we can take this, um, we start out with a kind of operational model of a computation where you're just kind of cranking the machine and <clears throat> we want to know what can we uh, solve in this computational model by retranslating it into the language of simplicial complexes and uh, using classical results like uh, simplicial approximation, uh, connectivity, and so on. Uh, we can give this characterization. I don't have time to show you applications of this, but uh, you know, they're very nice applications to uh, various uh, simple uh, problems, you know, case set agreement and so on. Case set agreement is nice because it's a wonderful application of Schwerner's lemma. And uh, you, know, you should, uh, if you ever get a chance to kind of leaf through our uh, book, then uh, you know, that's one of the things to look for. Okay, so um, in the end, the um, sort of polemical point that I want to make, now, now you're a, a very uh, friendly audience in, in this case, but uh, you, know, you try to explain this to a bunch of grizzled computer scientists and they, they tend to uh, get, uh, get feisty. You know, their reaction is, you want me to learn what? But the, the idea here is that the um, operational, we, most of people who do things about algorithms and so on use operational reasoning. You know, they'll establish invariants, they have uh, this kind of logic and that kind of logic. And uh, they, they tend to know a lot about uh, logic and, and about probability and graph theory, but uh, unfamiliar with uh, simplicial complexes and combinatorial topology. And <clears throat> so the claim that I want to make is that operational reasoning looks like this picture here. You know, it, it's not, uh, you know, it's very complicated and it uh, works, but, uh, you know, I've learned not to say that it lacks elegance because that makes people very angry, but uh, it do, it's not to everyone's uh, taste. Whereas operational reasoning is, uh, again, I'm not exaggerating here, this actual use of uh, combinatorial reasoning. Uh, it seems to me to be kind of more natural and powerful way of uh, doing things. You know, the uh, downside is you've got to learn some uh, topology, but after all, that's uh, what, what we're all here for, right? Okay, that's, um, that's all I have to say. Oh yeah, th th that was an isolated example. So, so the theorem is for an, a different model of computation where any number of uh, processes can crash. Uh, for um, purposes of example, I just showed you this somewhat contrived uh, model that just says that uh, we can lose. The, the point I wanted to illustrate was if you change your assumptions about communication, that changes everything in some sense. So if, if we had, so, so what, one thing I've shown you, implication is that if you have an asynchronous model, no matter how long you run, you're not going to change the connectivity of the complex. In a timed model where you can detect failures, that's not true. Uh, th then, uh, then the connectivity goes down by dimension the longer you run. In a, if you have a uh, model of computation where you have uh, atomic test and set or compare and swap operations, then again, you can, you can tear holes in complexes which you can't do with, uh, with read-write. So, so there, <coughs> the assumptions that you make about the uh, uh, model of computation have a big effect on the topological machinery that, uh, that you need. If you're willing to do, for example, probabilistic um, uh, algorithms, then you end up with uh, complexes with uh, probability measures on them. And the thing, things get you know, considerably more involved in, in, in that case. So this is really kind of the, the, the very simplest uh, case that I thought I could squeeze it the, into this time. Any more questions? 
you talked about uh, connectivity. Is there an interpretation to higher dimensional uh, topology? Uh, oh, 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 yes. So, for example, one, um, one classical problem. Suppose, let's relax consensus. Consensus, everyone has to agree on one value. Suppose instead we want to agree on discarding a value. So if we start out with n, different, n plus 1 different values, and we want everybody to terminate with no more than n, which means that uh, one value is forgotten. So it turns out this model of computation, that's, that's also impossible. Uh, you can't even forget uh, something. And uh, the way you can, one way to prove this is you can show that if you could solve this problem, then you, went, you, could, you after a certain amount of work, you show that that's a Schperner coloring of uh, the protocol complex. And then you show that uh, you can't do Schperner colorings of these things because they're connected uh, uh, too highly. And so uh, you know, we use higher dimensional connectivity to uh, extend the uh, continuous map. Uh, when we, uh, if we try to prove this for colored uh, tasks where the identity of who has the, the, the input uh, can be important, uh, then we need, uh, we, we need to use that kind of machinery in a somewhat more involved uh, way. But the yeah, higher dimensional connectivity is, it comes up all, all the time. Is there a difference between, uh, in, in the whole of this theory, can you sometimes, uh, you're only using homological connectivity or sometimes you're using different... So, so, so in the very beginning we started using, we, um, we, were talk, we talked about homology, but it turns out that well, we, all that we care about is, is uh, connectivity. And uh, using things like a the nerve theorem and so on, we can uh, treat connectivity in a very more kind of combinatorial, inductive uh, way. So uh, all we do is we say, <coughs> well, you know, we'll, we'll start out saying, you know, a simplex is uh, connected in all the dimensions because it's contractible, a sphere isn't, and you can use a nerve lemma to uh, build uh, these things up inductively. And if you take those as axioms, then we don't even need to dimension uh, 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 homology or homotopy groups. We just say it's connected, which means that you can you know, fill in the continuous maps. And so it, it's, a, it's sort of a trick that we do to try to avoid having to explain what homology is to people in our community who don't. Yeah, but essentially you use homological connectivity rather than, say, uh, you know, topological connectivity. Then well, well, no, we're really using topological connectivity because you know, we're, we're sort of extending maps or showing that these maps uh, don't, don't, don't exist. But, but uh, we, we want, want to do this in kind of a, uh, a way without having to explain what a uh, fundamental group is. And, and you don't want, you don't want to, uh, perfect fundamental groups? Uh, well, you know, we, all, all we want is to uh, you know, extend maps. And, and uh, we want the uh, cheapest uh, uh, ticket that will, uh, uh, that will get us that far. And uh, you know, I think we found the most, the most effective way to do that is just say, here, here's some axioms about how these things glue together. Uh, you know, trust us on these, and uh, and then we 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 will not speak of uh, you know how we make this sausage. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Okay, so let's take uh, Maurice again.